I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In episode 2 we learned how the letter to the Hebrews is structured and that the first 10 chapters is all about Jesus and how he is better than prophets and angels, Moses and the promised land, Aaron and the priesthood and even the mysterious priest king called Melchizedek. In episode 3 we will learn of the third warning of the letter to the Hebrews. We have already encountered the first two and will end in the well-known 11th chapter of Hebrews, the heroes of faith. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveller in Christ, and this is The Journey through the Scriptures podcast. In the last episode, we learned that David, in Psalm 110, declared the Messiah, Jesus, a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, in that he is instantly and permanently available. Jesus strengthens us with the impartation of his own life, symbolised in Genesis 4 verses 18, by the bread and the wine that Melchizedek brought to Abraham. This symbolizes the body and the blood of Christ. In connection with this impartation, there is a third warning, which is the danger of falling away. This is one of the most serious warnings in the book and is found in Hebrews 6 verses 4 to 6. Here the use of pronouns is changed from you and we to those. This tells us that the author is referring to a specific group of people. For in the case of those who have been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, stumbled or went astray, it is impossible to renew, restore them again to repentance, since, while they are again crucified to themselves, the Son of God and put him to open shame. This is considered by many to be the most difficult verse to interpret in the entire New Testament. The key word here is enlightened. Enlightened does not mean saved. It means intellectually convinced. These are people who are convinced that Jesus is the Christ but have never committed themselves to him. For many this passage is interpreted that in some cases believers can fall away and somehow lose their salvation. But this opinion is contradictory to a number of passages in scripture, namely John 3.16 which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And again in John 10, Verses 27 to 28. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them an eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Romans 8 1 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verses 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Without following the Arminian theology that says there are believers who have lost their salvation, or the Calvinist view that argues People like this were never believers, or the hypothetical view that teaches that these events had not actually occurred, I think it is important to understand who the audience of this letter is and what was happening to them. If we skip ahead a little to Hebrews 10 verses 32 to 34, we get a clue that the Hebrew Christians were or had been facing persecution and hardship. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew that there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. 
Persecution of Christian in those days, as it is today, often comes with the pressure to not be different, to not stand out, but to follow the crowd and to not draw attention to yourself. Can you relate to that? If this is true now, it would most definitely have been true then. Another thing you need to also consider is that being a Jew in the Roman Empire was not a punishable crime. The Jewish religion was categorized as religio licita, which is Latin for permitted religion. It was a Roman custom to permit foreign communities in Rome to maintain their ancestral religion, unless the specific practices were regarded as disruptive or subversive. Christianity, however, was a religio illicita, or an impermissible religion, as it was regarded as disruptive and subversive. Keeping that in mind, it appears that some of the Jewish believers had been persuaded to return to Judaism, either partially or fully, to avoid or ease persecution, essentially joining the ranks of those who crucified Christ, resulting in a fresh public rejection and humiliation of Christ all over again. When Jewish believers brought an animal to the Jewish temple to be sacrificed, they were identifying themselves with the unbelieving Jews who had crucified Christ. So this act was tantamount to a public rejection of Jesus Christ, and was a declaration that his death was insufficient. Later, in Hebrews 10 verses 29, the writer confirms this. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? So the warning is, don't be like those Jewish believers who have turned away from Christianity to once again practice Judaism. And don't return to the Levitical system of sacrifice under the Mosaic law, but rather grow in maturity in Christ, the Son of God, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and set aside dead works. So, the warning is, don't be like those Jewish believers who have turned away from Christianity to once again practice Judaism. And don't return to the Levitical system of sacrifice under the Mosaic law, but rather grow in maturity in Christ, the Son of God, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and set aside dead works. The warning is ended in Hebrews 6 verses 9 by two simple words, yet and your. This replaces the reference to those of the previous verses and the warning is over. Though we speak thus, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things that belong to salvation. The fifth challenger is the tabernacle and the law. This features in Hebrews chapters 8 through to 10. These are the things that religious people trust in the most. Buildings or institutions and self-effort, which is represented by the law. The writer now compares Christ to this. And he draws a sharp contrast in Hebrews 9 verses 24 to 25. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Jesus takes the old temple in the wilderness and the temple in Jerusalem and he says, it's just a building. The real tabernacle has always been a man or a woman, any believer. God has always intended us to be his tabernacle, not buildings. He is not interested in buildings. So the old tabernacle or the temple in Jerusalem or a cathedral or a church or a school hall is nothing but a building. The true house of God is you. We are his house. He dwells in us. That is what Colossians 1 verses 27 declares so clearly. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, regarding the law, which is connected with the tabernacle, 
We are all aware of what the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 verses 2 to 17 demand of us. You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, you shall not bow down to idols, you shall worship the Lord your God, and so on. These are wonderful laws, but they all fail when man attempts to obey them. Paul declares in the letter to the Romans in chapter 8 verses 3, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. We are not able to meet the demands of the law. Even when we try our best, all we can achieve is an outward external obedience, but our hearts and our attitudes within are most times wrong, and we know it. In Hebrews, Jesus is shown to have the solution to this. His solution is to write the law on our hearts and to put the Spirit of God within us to keep prompting us to love. And love is the fulfilling of the law. In Hebrews 8 verses 8 to 13, God declares the following. When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. This section comes right out of the book of Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34. So, if we yield ourselves to the love of the Spirit, which is pouring out from within us, we will be automatically and unconsciously fulfilling the law. God writes His law upon our hearts, and because He never leaves us, He deals fully with our guilt during these times when we do fail. God has already solved that problem in the cross, and He provides all the power we need to walk in righteousness, if we will take it. The law can never do that. All the law does is demand. It never enables us to obey it, but Jesus comes in and enables us. Jesus is faithful, and it is he who calls us, and Jesus will also do it for us. The fourth warning of Hebrews is found in Hebrews 10 verses 26 to 31. For if we sin deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin but a fearful prospect of judgment and a fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. A man who has violated the law of Moses dies without mercy at the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the man who has spurned the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and outraged the Spirit of grace? There is something that I would like to mention here, and that is that in some Bibles, verse 26 is wrongly translated. It's translated as, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of truth. The original Greek word here is hekousios, and it is found in only one other place in the New Testament, in 1 Peter 5.2, and here it is translated as willingly. While the difference between willfully and willingly might seem inconsequential to many people, there is a difference, and that difference has to do with human nature. Human beings have a nature that is willful, rebellious, and stubborn. They sin inconsiderately, out of ignorance, or from weakness. They cannot act in any other way. That is their sinful nature. However, this differs significantly from sinning willingly. This is not a sin one can stumble into suddenly. This is not the normal falterings of a Christian still learning how to walk in the Spirit. 
This sinning implies a deliberate and carefully considered act. The perpetrator carefully chooses and prepares to abandon Christ, to turn away from God and his way and to become the enemy once again. This is why I think many of the modern translators render Hebrews 10.26 to read, For if we sin deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, which is far better. Just think about this for a moment. At the cost of the life of his son, God provides for us a way of being righteous before him. He empowers from within through the Holy Spirit. We are kept strong and pure in the midst of a broken and corrupted world, and yet we deliberately cast it aside and say, No thank you Lord, I'll do it on my own. Despite having the advantage of full enlightenment, if there is no change in behavior and sin continues to dominate the life of professed believers by a deliberate willing act, there is no hiding place from God's wrath. And because there is no sacrifice other than Christ to pay for that sin, and the only way of escape is rejected as well. Could there be anything more insulting to God to presume so on his grace? With the tabernacle and the law eliminated, there are no challenges left. So, in the last section of the letter, chapters 11 to 13, the writer of Hebrews comes to the means of obtaining all that God has, which is faith. We saw that chapter 10 ended with both a warning and a word of encouragement. The encouragement refers to those who have faith, in contrast to those who shrink back. The chapter is full of a clear definition of faith, along with numerous examples. In chapter 11, you can learn what faith is, how faith works, how faith looks, and how to recognize faith. Henry David Thoreau, a famous American poet and philosopher, said, If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music he hears, however measured or far away. This is an accurate description of faith. Christians walk as though they are listening to another drum beat, and are considered to be out of step with this world. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is often called the Heroes of Faith, and introduces a long list of heroic figures from the Old Testament. Remarkable men and women whose stories stand out to encourage and challenge the faith. Some of these heroes are well-known personalities, while others remain anonymous. There are over 20 names in the list, and everyone shows us what faith is and how faith acts. Faith anticipates the future. Faith acts in the present. And faith appraises or evaluates the past. If you look at any of these heroes of faith, you will see these three principles at work. Take Abraham for instance. Verse 10 says that Abraham looked forward to the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This was not the city of Jerusalem, but Abraham in faith was anticipating the future for that heavenly building of which God is the architect and owner. This is in Revelation 21 verses 2 and verse 14. In verse 17 it says, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son. In other words, he was acting in the present. Abraham's faith allowed him to appraise the past and decided that since he had been called to go out to the place which he was to receive as an inheritance, and since he had sojourned in the land of promise, God would continue to lead and bless him. It is all there in verses 8 and 9. The Old Testament heroes didn't have any of the revelation we have in Christ. They didn't have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And yet, these men and women went on believing, even though they never knew what they believed in. Faith to them was not a once-off decision at the Gospel Crusade, but an ongoing trust that continued until they died, even though they never saw what was promised. So we need to remember and apply these principles 
whenever our faith is put to the test. Faith anticipates the future. Faith acts in the present. And faith appraises the past. This is David Wells, your fellow traveling Christ. And this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 3.